All right. Okay, giant slides check. Students check. Okay. How's everybody? Good. It's the post-lunch lecture slot. Okay, today we're going to talk about constraint satisfaction problems, or CSPs as we lovingly call them for short. So far, we've been talking about search. And uh, we can ask, what's search for? Search is for a very particular class of problems. When you have a problem that can be formulated in that way, search is an algorithm you can use to solve your problem. But in order to apply search, it's going to make certain assumptions about the world. It's going to assume that there's just one agent. That's you. You're making your plan, but there's no other agents whose actions can be uncertain or adversarial. It means the world is deterministic. You have to be able to assume that the plan you've come up with, your master plan, when executed, will go exactly the way it worked according to your model. That means your model has to be correct, and the world has to be deterministic. It also assumes that you're in a fully observed state. So you know the way the world is now, and so you can predict in simulation how it will evolve when you model it, and then you have your plan and you can go execute it. It also assumes that your state space is discrete. So these are all simplifications. And during this semester, we're going to unpack and relax some of these and show how we can come up with new algorithms when the world isn't quite so single-agent, deterministic, fully observed, and discrete as we may like. Search in general, so far, has been for a class of search problems that uh, are called planning problems. And in a planning problem, what you're interested in is the sequence of actions. When you find your goal state, what you really want to know is, what is that master plan that gets me from the start state to the goal? And so the path to the goal is the important thing. And this gets us into discussions of things like paths having costs and depths. You either want a cheap path or maybe a short path. And the way that you inject information about a particular search problem, as opposed to just a black box uninformed search procedure, is through heuristics, which sort of give a little bit of a, a certain kind of a hint to the problem. It says, hey, the goals may be over this way. You're headed in the wrong direction. And that's a way to take this fully generic notion of a search problem and inject a little bit of bias that helps you solve your problem better because you know something about it, maybe because of it's embedded in space or something like that. And here in the illustration, you can imagine this ninja, uh, this ninja robot who's trying to steal the gem. And what the ninja robot really wants to do is figure out what is the complex, precise sequence of actions which will get me through the maze of security into that gem. But there's another class of search problems as well. Um, and these are the identification problems. These problems usually take the form of an assignment of values to variables. And in identification problems, you're not really so concerned with how long the solution is. In general, they're all the same length because all the variables get an assignment. And um, you're not concerned with the path. You're not concerned with how you came up with this assignment. You just want to know the assignment itself. And CSPs are a special class of identification problems. And because they're a special class of identification problems, we have new algorithms that let us exploit the fact that instead of a black box search procedure where all you really get to know is a successor function and a goal test and maybe some costs, now suddenly we're going to have a little bit of visibility into the CSP, and that little bit of visibility is going to let us tailor algorithms that are more efficient because we can make more assumptions about the problem. So in this case, you might have the detective robot who comes to the scene and needs to figure out what's going on, but it's not so important which rug he looks under first. He just wants to know what is the explanation for everything I'm seeing, and that might be a case of an identification problem. It's also very common in identification problems that paths are all at the same depth. And that means it's going to totally change our outlook on things like breadth-first versus depth-first search. So let's talk about CSPs. What we're going to do today is we're going to define them. We're going to see some examples that sort of stretch different sides of CSPs. And then we're going to talk about algorithms for solving them. And just like in search, there are different algorithms for solving them that are going to have trade-offs between various kinds of computation and efficiency. One of the running problems we're going to have is map coloring. So how many people have seen map coloring in some class somewhere? OK, it's pretty intuitive. You're going to have a map. There's no colors. You want to put colors on the countries. And it's really, really bad if two adjacent countries have the same color. Right? That's like crossing the streams. You don't do it. And so we're going to have constraints that say don't do that. And we're going to work through that as an example. 
It's certainly not the only CSP. So don't go thinking that all the CSPs in the world involve colors and inequality constraints. OK, so let's talk about um, how CSPs are different from a standard search problem. Remember, in a search problem, as I said, a state is a black box. It's some data structure. Who knows what it is? You'll see this in your projects. You can't like look into the state and, oh, there's a hash table, and I can look up the values. You don't get any of that. The only thing you can do on a state is what? You can call get successor, and you can call is goal. And that's it. That's your whole API. And whatever's behind that search abstraction, no idea. And that abstraction is powerful, but it's limiting. Because the successor function can be anything, and the goal test can be any function over states. You can think of this like a judge. These search states come along the conveyor belt, and the judge is like, not a goal, not a goal, not a goal, goal, right? And that's all you have. You can present a complete plan to the judge, and you either get told, yep, that's a goal, or no, that's not. In a CSP, we've got some structure. And the structure is the hook that lets us have better algorithms. And in that structure, we assume it's not just a black box in our state. Um, in a CSP, you have a set of variables, often called x, x sub i. And each variable has value, uh, has values that come from a domain. Sometimes the domain varies uh, by i. And that's a domain D. And so each of these variables takes on a value. And, and you can talk about an assignment of values in the domain to the variables. That's your state. So successor functions now are things like assign a new variable. And that's it, because you know what your state looks like. You also know what your goal test is. Your goal test is a set of constraints which specify which combinations of values and variables are legal. OK, so instead of a judge just telling you legal, illegal, illegal, legal, instead you've got, you've got a list of, of rules. You've got the laws. And you can look at these, and you can see, OK, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I'm breaking this law right now. OK, I violated a constraint here. And because your goal function has sort of been uh, decomposed into multiple rules, you can do things like detect errors early. This is also a simple example. It's our first but not our last example of a formal representation language. So like in the real world, there are CSP solvers. They're super complicated. They do all the things they do inside. And when you write a CSP, you write, OK, well, here are my values. Here are my, here are my variables. Here are their values. Here are the constraints between these. Here's an explicit constraint. Here's an implicit constraint. And in doing that, you're writing down a model of the world in CSP speak. It's not the only way to write a model. It's not the only one we'll see here. But it's a representation language that then the problem solver on the other side has special purpose algorithms to find you a solution. As we already talked about, because we can peek inside the state, we can have better algorithms than standard search. OK, so we're going to do some examples. Hopefully, you all know your geography of Australia, because we're going to talk about it a lot. Uh, this is all you need to know. Um, Australia is divided into, uh, I believe they're called states, and we're going to color them colors. So our first example is map coloring, as I said. So we're going to see Australia a lot. It's also a running example in the book. And in this case, We've got, we want to color the map, and we want to have adjacent countries not have the same color, so we need to formalize this as a CSP. So step one, we need variables. Here the variables will be the different states. So WA is the variable for Western Australia. That was unexpected. That was also unexpected. All right, in the worst case, you can all come huddle around my laptop. <laughs> OK, so Western Australia, that's a variable. The Northern Territory in the North, South Australia in the South, 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 Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria in the East, and Tasmania is a sort of disconnected island. You can color it whatever you want because it's disconnected from the rest. That's actually going to be really important later. So there are the variables. They're going to be domains. Now I'm paranoid. I'm looking back. If it goes out, like, catch my attention. Otherwise, I'll just, like, I can see it. OK, so what are the domains? Well, we need values to assign. And the domains here might be red, green, and blue in this, uh, in this map coloring here. Now, of course, if that was it, there were just variables and domains, a solution would be an assignment of variables giving each variable a value in the domain. So we just color it all red, and we say we're done. So we need some constraints. We need something that tells us coloring everything red is not OK. And so the constraints here in English, say adjacent regions must have different colors. How are we going to write that down? Well, we could write them down in, as what are called implicit constraints. Like we might write WA not equal to NT. Effectively, an implicit constraint is a little snippet of code that you can execute and will tell you whether or not 
everything's okay or whether or not it's broken. So here's a little snippet of code that looks up the value of WA, looks up the value of NT, and if they're not the same, it says thumbs up. Okay, so an implicit constraint is a piece of code you execute to see if you violated the constraint. But of course, any quality like this, we could write it out explicitly. An explicit constraint is something like the pair WA and T has the following elements as legal elements of their joint cross domain. So WA comma NT can be one of the following pairs, red, green, red, blue, blue, green, whatever, so, so on and so on, but not red, red. Okay, implicit versus explicit constraints. It's going to be a, an important distinction that's going to keep coming up. A solution is an assignment where every variable takes on a value in the domain that satisfies all the constraints. So here's one. This is the one that's in the picture as well. Western Australia is red, Northern Territories are green, Queensland's red, New South Wales is green, and so on. There are other solutions. This isn't the only one. This is a solution. In general, in CSPs, we're asking the question, find me a solution. There may be a lot. In general, if there's one, there's going to be a lot. There's often exponentially many. Here's another example. N queens. How many of you know the N queens problem? How many of you would say you're frequent N queens players? Okay. So what's N queens? N queens is a, a puzzle. Uh, you have a chessboard of some usually square size. And so this is four by four. And on that square chessboard, you're going to place queens. And they follow the normal queen attack or threat uh, configurations. So for example... Um, this one here attacks to here, to here, and on these diagonals. And so what you want in N queens is to be able to place N of these queens on the board such that none of them are threatening. Okay, so we know the rules that make queens fight, and we would like to have a peaceful kingdom. So let's formulate this as a CSP. You need a CSP, you need variables. So here's our first formulation. Our first formulation, well, what are the variables? Let's make the variables the squares. So how many variables will we have? We'll have kind of four by four of them. You'll have the two-dimensional grid of variables. So we'll have a bunch of x, i, j's. So in n, there are now quadratically many variables. And what is on each square? Well, it's either queened or unqueened, right? It's either full or empty. So we could say the domains are maybe zero or one, or we could write it as empty comma queen or something like that. So we've got variables, we've got domains, and if this were the end of the CSP, we'd just leave it blank. We just, or whatever, or we put queens wherever we want, it would all be fine, so we need some constraints. So what are the constraints? The constraints need to be the things that say certain configurations are okay and certain ones aren't. So we could write them down. So we could say, for example, um, for any pair, so here's i, j, and k, so x, i, j, and x, i, k, so that's like this one and this one, because they share a coordinate. We could say the legal um, explicitly the legal elements of their cross domain that are allowed are 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, but not 1, 1, because these two variables, if you're xij and xik, and you're both 1, that's a threat. And so somewhere in here is buried the information that you're not allowed to threaten vertically. And you could have all the rest, the thing that says you can't threaten vertically, you can't threaten horizontally, and you can't threaten along a diagonal, and you could write those out, and there would be a bunch of these things that say for these two squares... Here's the joint constraint on those two variables. This is almost right. So if I wrote out all these constraints and these variables, there's actually there's a really easy solution. What's the easy solution under all these? Yeah, set everything to zero. Doesn't violate any of these constraints. And there's nothing here that says you have to have anything about n queens in your n queen problem. So we would need one more constraint. And we could write that out in various ways. Here's an implicit way of writing that out, that if you sum up all of the xij's, you'll get n, right? In order to figure out whether or not you're okay, you're going to have to run some code that loops maybe two for loops and a sum, something like that. This one's backed by code. In general, when we do the analysis, we'll always think about their explicit um, uh, versions. Okay, so that's n queens. This isn't a very good formulation of n queens. Just like in search problems, you can sometimes formulate things a different way that builds more of the solution structure into the problem, more constraint, and therefore makes it easier to solve. Often this gives you a smaller space that's easier to solve, and this is true for both search and for CSPs. So what else could we do? How else could we set up our variables here? We could use the information that we know that there's going to be one queen in each, let's say, row. If we did that, 
We could say the variables each row has a Q sub K. And now the domains are different because now the variables represent in row three, where is the queen? We know there has to be one. And so we don't have to worry about that sum to n constraint. And now the domains just say which column uh, is that queen in. Now again, we have to write down the constraints. And here the constraints are actually a little bit more complicated. So we can write them down implicitly saying for all i and j, that means for all pairs of queens, they don't threaten each other. Or we could just start writing this down like queen one and queen two together can't take on any values other than one three, that's okay. One four, that's okay. But like one two would not be okay because then they would be diagonally threatening. Okay? Let's end queens. Any questions? Because we have variables and there are constraints between them, we have another tool that's going to be at the core of a lot of the algorithms that we're going to develop for CSPs. And actually, this is all going to show up again later when we talk about Bayes nets, sort of in an isomorphic way. And that is we can talk about the constraint graph. This is the graph that is formed by having a node for each variable and then some representation for constraints. If all the constraints are binary, that is, they connect uh, two variables, we can have arcs represent constraints. There's another notation that we'll see in a second. So here, this is Australia decomposed into a node for each of the variables and an arc for each of the constraints. So because Western Australia and Southern Australia share a border, there's an arc here, which tells you right here there is a constraint between them, but you'd have to like peek inside to see that that constraint is actually an inequality constraint. The constraint graph doesn't tell you what the constraints are, but it tells you where they are, and that gives you powerful pieces of information that let you decompose and use different algorithms that are appropriate for different shapes um, and topologies of these graphs. Okay, so a binary CSP is one in which each constraint relates at most two variables. So often you have what are called unary constraints, which are really just domain reductions. This, this state has to be green for whatever reason. A constraint graph nodes or variables arc show constraints, and the structure will speed up the search problem. So let's take a look and see what this looks like for n queens. All right. So what's n queens look like? The way we've been drawing it, let's do five queens. All right, and we could call these A, B, C, D, and E, and then we could call the columns one, two, three, four, five, and then we could place, you know, a queen right here, and that would be the assignment that uh, that A equals it's gone, A equals five, A equals two. All right, let's look at this as a graph. This is going to be in an applet that we'll see a couple times. Is a nice applet by the folks at AI Space. And in here, each variable is a circle. And you can see something other than just the names of the variables here. You can see their domains. And right now, their domains are all 1 through 5 because we haven't picked anything yet uh, for our CSP. You can also see that between two things, like between A and B, there is this constraint that is helpfully called Queens 1. What the heck is Queens 1? It's a constraint between A and B. So what is it going to say under the hood there? It's going to be things like 1, 1 is not okay, because then they'd be vertically threatening. 1, 2 is not okay, because then they'd be diagonally threatening. 1, you know, 3 is okay. And that's what lives inside Queens 1. So from this graph here, you can see the structure of which nodes are connected to each other by constraints. You just can't see what the constraints are. We'll come back and see this again later when we talk about uh, constraint propagation. Here's another example. Maybe some of you have done these cryptarithmetic problems. Um, the idea is you're supposed to make each letter be a digit such that the math works out. And uh, in this case, it'll work out both in words and in numbers. And so the variables would be uh, the T's, the W's, the O's, all of those letters. But there's also some other variables you need. Okay, In this case, you need three extra variables. Does anybody know what those variables represent? Because you're going to want to write something like uh, O plus O equals R, but that's not kind of quite right. There's something else going on here. Those are the carry bits. So we need to introduce some variables here for the carry bits, and their domains are going to be the digits, and the carry bits will maybe have limited domains. What about the constraints? Well, one constraint that goes with these problems is that they all be different. Otherwise, you just assign everything to zero, and it would be fine. Okay, so an all diff constraint is an interesting constraint because it's a constraint that touches a whole bunch of variables. In this case, that's not so bad because you can actually break it up into a bunch of pairwise, all different constraints. 
And you would have other constraints, like O plus O equals R plus 10 times the carry bit, whatever it is, 0 or 1. And you could write all of these down. If you drew out the constraint graph, though, you'd have a problem, because what about this all different constraint? How do you draw an arc that touches more than two things? And the answer is, in general, uh, that people draw squares to represent the constraints, and then a bunch of lines going to all of the participating variables. Okay, and you can see this is sort of a special case of the other one uh, when you just put a square in the middle of every arc. Okay? How many people have played Sudoku? Okay, Sudoku's fun. The variables are the open squares. The domains are 1 through 9. The constraints here say that for each column, they all have to be different. For each row, all the digits have to be different. And also for each little uh, uh, region, they all have to be different. There's actually one more kind of constraint in a Sudoku problem, which is typically there are a lot of squares that are already filled in with values, and you can think of those as unary constraints. In your solution, this square right here must be the number one. Now, you can imagine a unary constraint where, like, this one can be three or seven. As far as I know, that's not a thing you do in Sudoku. But you could. You could call it CS188 Sudoku with unary constraints. Um, interestingly, you may know that some Sudoku problems are really easy. You, like, pick something, and then there's another one that's pinned down, and then you pick another one that's pinned down, and another one, and then you're solved. And in other cases, you scratch your head, and you try things, and you backtrack, and you try a couple things, and you detect a problem, and you backtrack. And actually, that difficulty in computation that, that you have doing harder Sudoku problems compared to easier ones has a really deep connection to the algorithms we're going to learn um, for CSPs and their complexity. Okay, one of our last examples here, the Waltz algorithm. This is not how people do computer vision today, but it's an early computer vision algorithm uh, that is an algorithm for, for interpreting line drawing. So, like, if I look at these three-dimensional-ish drawings here, you might notice things like, well, like, this corner, this this sort of uh, corner here, these three lines, they're like an Audi, right? And, and, and these ones here, at least in the easy interpretation, that, that's an innie. And so you look at these things, and, and you kind of can't tell. Like, your brain does it, but what's sticking out? What's in? What's occluding what? And these kinds of questions... Uh, that is an uh, interpretation of these, uh, of these line drawings. And you can pose this as a CSP where you say, well, each intersection, so here and here and here and here and here and here, each intersection is going to be a variable. And the values are sort of going to be things like it's an Audi versus it's an Innie. And the constraints are going to be things like if two things are connected, you can't have one that's kind of convex and the other is concave. So like if you're connected to something, then you're both sort of Audis in the appropriate way or Innies. And so the solutions correspond to physically realizable 3D interpretations of these drawings. And this is an early example of a case where computation gives rise to intelligence or reasoning in, a, in an AI domain that was kind of very different from search. Any questions on that before we get into uh, varieties and solutions? All right, there are a bunch of kinds of CSPs in the world. Those that we'll talk about and those we won't. Um, what we're going to talk about most in this class is CSPs that have discrete variables. In general, we're going to talk about ones with finite domains, and that means that if each domain has d, vari d values in, uh, in that domain, then the complete assignments are something like order d to the n. That's already bad news, right? That's already exponential in the number of variables in the CSP. This includes things like Boolean CSPs, including satisfiability, where each of the variables has two things, true and false, and the constraints are things like conjunct uh, clauses and things like that. And we already know that's, uh, that, that this is MP-hard, this is MP-complete, uh, which uh, you should have gotten from other classes. But there are other CSPs, for example, cases where um, any integer is a val valid uh, member of the domain, or string-valued variables, which are even harder. When things have linear constraints, things like job scheduling, where like this job has to end before this job starts and things like that, these things are solvable, though they're still very hard to solve. Once you have nonlinear constraints, things can sort of get undecidable very quickly. And of course, there's also continuous variables, like we're going to have a telescope and it's going to have integer, or it's going to have not integer, sort of abstract times, it's going to have real valued times, or uh, you know, any number of cases. And in the case of linear constraints, these are linear programs. And uh, you saw, I think, a little bit in, in CS70 and certainly in 170 how to solve these. Um, there are good polynomial uh, time approaches to these, but in general, continuous variables are also very hard. Varieties of constraints. We talked about unary constraints. Those are 
you should think of them as um, restrictions on a domain. That's important because we're going to have algorithms that also restrict domains, and you're going to need to know how those relate to unary constraints. Binary constraints doesn't mean the variables are binary. Those are binary variables, binary domains. Binary constraints involve two variables at a time, like SA and WA are not equal. And higher order constraints are like what we saw in crypto arithmetic, where you can have three or more. There's also preferences, or what people call soft constraints, like color this map, but I, I like red. Use red if you can. Red's better than green. And these are often represented by having variable assignments that have costs, either costs on the domains or costs uh, sort of on soft constraints. This gives a kind of constrained optimization problem that we're going to say nothing about here, but is going to be sort of, uh, it's going to be very relevant when we get to Bayes nets because Bayes nets are, are a form of uh, reasoning over these kinds of graph structures with uh, real value costs. Okay, but not today. CSPs are all over in the real world. Actually, really, really common technology. You probably run into a CSPs all the time. Probably the most common one is, hey, I have a bunch of friends. When can we all meet? Or got to meet for uh, some, some work-related thing. Here, here's when I'm available. I'm available here um, and trying to find intersections of those things. There's also timetabling, like that schedule that campus has to do to figure out which classes go where so that we can fit all the students with kind of minimum overflow um, versions of this or CSPs. And they're really all over the place. So this is, this is a kind of technology that, that crops up all over the place in the real world. In the real world, of course, a lot of these things have real valued variables and not just uh, discrete ones. Let's solve some CSPs. All right, so we're going to be a CSP detective here. So we'll start with the, the standard search formulation for CSPs. We'll talk about another formulation next lecture. In the standard search formulation for CSPs, um, states are defined by the values of that are assigned so far. So you can call these partial assignments. So the initial state at the root of the search tree is going to be an empty assignment where no variables have any values. And the successor function is going to assign a value to an unassigned variable. The goal test is going to not just be, is it a complete full uh, assignment, uh, but it also has to satisfy all of the constraints. Okay, that's, this would be the simplest way of mapping CSPs into search. Your successor function assigns another variable, and the goal test is all constraints are satisfied, and I, uh, um, I've assigned all the variables. So we'll start with the dumbest thing uh, that could possibly work. We will see that it doesn't work, and we'll improve it. So let's think about this graph here. This is the uh, map coloring problem for uh, the Australia problem. And we could think, what's, gonna, what's breadth first search going to do? Well, there's going to be a search tree, and there's going to be a root. right? Remember breadth first search from before? What's going to be at the root is the empty assignment. And that's got successors. And what do the successors look like? They look like things like Western Australia equals red. And that's going to have some... Uh, that's going to have some uh, successors like Western Australia equals red and South Australia equals green. And that's going to have successors, which will have successors. And you get this big exponential tree that encodes all of the combinatorially many uh, ways of assigning these values to these variables. What's breadth first search going to do? It's going to take the one off the top. It's going to say, are you a goal? Nope. So it's going to stripe through the second level of the tree. Is it going to find any solutions? No, because on this level, there's only one value assigned to each variable. So it'll go to the third level of the tree, accumulating an enormous queue as it does so. Stripe through the third level. Any solutions? Nope. 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 OK. And then where are the solutions? They're at the bottom. They're all at the bottom. This is like the nightmare scenario for breadth first search. Okay, breath first search like stays up at night worrying about what's going to happen if all the solutions are at the bottom because that means it has to explore like the entire tree. This is the worst possible case because you have to do everything at the other levels before you can even get to the bottom. So before we sort of made fun of depth first search, right? We love you depth first search, but you find weird solutions. Suddenly depth first search maybe doesn't seem so crazy because our search tree looks like this except it's sort of exponentially big on the bottom. All the solutions are down here, and depth of research is at least going to like make a decent effort at getting to where the solutions live, whereas breadth of research is going to like look everywhere where they aren't first. So all of the methods we're going to talk about are actually uh, based on depth of research, even though we spent all of last week making fun of depth of research. So let's take a look. 
So here is a search graph. This is for a map coloring problem, three colors, adjacent things which are connected by lines here can't be the same. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to run naive search. This is uh, this is actually even already a bit of an improvement, but this is basically just a naive thing. We're going to we're at the root. Okay, so we're going to do depth first search. We're going to add an assignment and recurse. So we're going to assign the first thing to blue. Great. We're going to go to the next level in the tree because depth first search follows the deepest thing on the queue. So we're going to do another assignment. What are we going to assign? It's going to be this uh, circle here um, to the right of the blue one. What are we going to assign to it? Remember, it's blue, green, and red. Blue. And now the next one. Blue, 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 blue. We have no successors, and we're also not a goal. So we'll pull something off the queue. And we'll sort of keep this up for a while. And in the interest of doing anything else in lecture, I won't actually run this whole thing. But this is what depth first search would do with a naive formulation. But this is kind of crazy, right? Why would you solve a CSP like this where you keep doing assignments and then only at the end discover that it doesn't work out? So we should be able to do better than this. How are we going to do better? Any ideas? Ideas. Yeah, so we should we should be checking these constraints as we go. Uh, the answer was uh, here was maybe the successor function could have the constraints built in, or at least we could look at the constraints as we go. Basically, we want to apply that goal test incrementally as we go. And the simplest uh, version of this is what's called backtracking search. It's not a very helpful name. It's just a classic name for this. It's the basic uninformed algorithm for CSPs. First idea, we do one variable at a time. Strictly speaking, the naive thing could assign any variable at any time, and it would still be a valid successor. But since these variable assignments are commutative, it doesn't matter what order you got to them. Remember, the path doesn't matter here. We're just going to fix an ordering. Then we consider one variable at a time, and we're going to check constraints as we go. So as soon as we violate a constraint, we're done. We don't have to keep going and checking whether somehow deeper in this tree, this is going to look better. Remember, we couldn't do that with search. This is only because in CSPs, once you violate a constraint, there's nothing you can do to unviolate it later. That's important. It's not true for search problems in general. It's true here, so we can stop early as soon as we have violated a constraint. Think of it as an incremental goal test. You can keep looking. Have I messed up yet? Have I messed up yet? Depth first search with these two improvements is called backtracking search. And in general, just as sort of a sanity check here, you can solve n queen problems for about n equals 25. And I'll track this number as we um, go up. Of course, you can always throw a compute and get a little bit further, but these are exponential uh, situations. All right. All right, here's an example. This is the root. And so we have three successors, which take the first variable in the ordering here, wa. We assign it in three different ways. We'll expand one of them. Now we'll have two things assigned. And then right here, we're going to look. And as soon as we see that we've made a mistake, we're going to cross things off. So the third successor here that has uh, Western Australia and Northern Australia both assigned to red, it's crossed off. So the whole tree below it, which is all doomed to failure, we don't even explore. And that's a big improvement. We can keep going. Here's the pseudocode for this, which I won't go through in sort of gory detail, but except to note a couple things. One, it's op often implemented recursively. This is a very bad idea with search because we would grow this giant queue that we wanted detailed control over. But here we pretty much just want to recurse and backtrack. So how does it work? Um, if the assignment is complete, you're done. Because if you were going to break a constraint, we would have seen it along the way. If it's not complete, then we have to select a variable that isn't assigned, and that's going to be a choice point. And then we have to go through the values in some order. That's going to be a choice point. For now, let's just assume there's a fixed order for those things. Then we're going to check a constraint. So what is this? This is depth first search plus var variable ordering plus a fail on violation. Let's take a look and see how that does in the applet. All right, so let's reset this. Let's go to backtracking. None of the other fancy things. First thing we'll get assigned blue. The next thing we'll get assigned red because there is no successor with blue because that successor violates a constraint. So at least we don't make a mistake on our second step, which we will not discover, we will not sort of fix until we do an exponential amount of work. So that's good. All right, what's next? Well, blue. And then what? Red. 
Now, green, because blue would be a violation. And if we do this, it doesn't mean we don't backtrack. So green didn't actually work out, because let's go back. Because even though this green was OK, when you get to this, can you see my cursor? When you get to this one here, um, suddenly there's nothing left. There's nothing legal, and so we have to go back uh, to, the, to the queue. But we can sort of keep going. I'll just let it play faster. And so there's a little bit of backtracking, but now we can get through this small graph because at least we're only doing things that are legal so far, and there's a limited amount of backtracking when we make something whose problem is a little further downstream. Okay. All right. One nice thing about CSPs is often there are general purpose ideas that aren't like, they're not like A-star heuristics that are custom to your search problem. They're general purpose, and they often give huge ranges, uh, huge gains in speed across a wide range of problems. Um, there's basically three classes of ideas, and we'll have time to do one to two of them today. The first one is ordering. Which variable should I actually work on next? And what order should I try the values? Maybe there's some variables that are better to work on now. Maybe there's some values that are more likely to work out. So that ordering of how you structure the choice of variable and value exploration is a big deal. The next thing is filtering. Is there a way to detect inevitable failure early, as opposed to just sort of waiting until you hit a dead end in your search? And the last thing is, the last class of approaches for improving CSPs is structure-based approaches. Can we look at the graph detect something efficient about its structure and use some algorithm that exploits that structure. And this is going to work for some kinds of graphs and not others, and we'll talk about these algorithms probably on Thursday. So for today, uh, let's talk about filtering. So what's filtering about? Filtering is about ruling out candidates. Unlike assignment where you say, all right, I'm going to try this variable. Filtering is about ruling out candidates for the variables you haven't yet considered in your assignment. Okay. So the simplest kind of filtering is something called forward checking. I'll illustrate what it is, and then we'll talk about the general idea behind this and uh, how it extends to other filtering algorithms. So in filtering, what we do is we keep track of domains for the unassigned variables. This is different. Before, it was just like there are variables, and as we go, we assign them. There's the ones that have a value and the ones that don't. Now there's a new idea here. Even before you assign a variable a value, you have a sort of domain cloud sitting there, which says, as far as I know, these are the legal candidates. And so here what we can see is all of the Australia nodes, none of them assigned to a color, but all of them with sort of a cloud saying all three values, as far as I know, are still in play. We're going to keep track of domains for these unassigned variables, and under certain circumstances, which will vary by the filtering algorithm, we're going to cross things off doesn't mean assigning the variable. It just means ruling things out so we can detect future failures. In what's called forward checking, we cross off values that violate a constraint if they're added to the existing assignment. So let's look at how this would work. So we look at the initial assignment, and we say, everything's OK so far. We have to assign something. And so maybe we assign red to the WA node, Western Australia. So what do things look like now? Let's, uh, maybe before I do it, I'll just out here. So let's assign red here. So WA has gone from unassigned to assigned. So it's red now. This would be it for the backtracking search. We'd assign it and we'd look for successors. But what forward checking does is forward checking says, all right, well, I've made an assignment to WA. So I'm going to go and I'm going to visit all of the other variables and check to see whether they have any, any values in their domains, which would trigger a violation, a constraint violation, when combined with my current assignment. And so I would go and I would say, all right, Queensland. All right, all those still work. How about the Northern Territories? I would look at that and I would say, well, green and blue are still fine, but red's not going to work anymore because it would violate uh, the inequality constraint against WA. So I would go and I would see if this will work. Magic. Okay, it's gone. So we would go through and we would visit all of the other variables, not assign them, but just cross things off their domain if it triggers a constraint violation. So the neighbors to WA would lose red. And then we could keep going. Uh, we could assign green over here to Queensland, which would assign green to Q. And then everything that neighbors Q would lose its green value. 
And so what you can see is, even in the variables that I haven't assigned yet, I'm starting to see variables having their domain shrink. And if a domain ever shrinks to zero, that means there's not going to be any possible way to do an assignment there, and that means we might as well stop now. So whenever you do filtering and a domain goes empty, you backtrack. All right, so sorry, keep going. As soon as we assign to V a blue, even though we haven't tried to as assign anything to South Australia, it's lost all of its values from its domain, and we know that there's no way to solve this. Now, if you think looking really closely, you might already realize that we were in trouble. Let me get a color. You might realize we were already in trouble up here, right? Because we knew NT was blue, and we also knew SA was going to be blue. And if you look closely, they're next to each other. But this is not forward checking's problem. Forward checking does not think this hard. All it does is check for immediate violations between unassigned variables and the assignment to date. Anything further is thinking too hard for forward checking. Okay, any questions on that? Let's do a demo on that. I'll do one more idea and then we'll take a break. Let's do a demo on that one. So let's go to forward checking. So, even before I assign anything, the domains have appeared inside the variables, and they all have complete domains because nothing's happened yet. But as soon as I assign to the first val variable, which in this ordering is the bottom left, and the kind of strike order here is blue first, um, then red, then green, if I assign blue, think about what's going to happen. We're going to look at all the other variables that are connected by a constraint, we're just, which are just its neighbors, and we're going to cross blue off. So there it is. We've propagated the constraint out, but not very far. And so when we go to the next one, it's either going to be red or green, because blue's already been crossed off. We're going to assign red, and a bunch of its neighbors lose a variable, lose a value. It's blue. Now, look at this. Do you have a bad feeling about this? I have a bad feeling about this. Do you know who doesn't have a bad feeling about this? Forward checking. Forward checking's going. All right, so we assign here, we assign here. Now we detect the problem. We don't detect the problem until we actually trigger the constraint check between those two variables with an assignment conflicting with an adjacent unassigned value. So, of course, we're going to have to backtrack. So forward checking helps us avoid some future mistakes, but it's still going to make mistakes. You're still going to have to backtrack. And when you backtrack, domains repopulate. And then we keep going through. And maybe this time, nope, not quite. This time we get through. Okay? So that's filtering. But in the back of our minds, we realize we could be working harder. We could be thinking further into the future um, to detect these violations before they happen. Okay. In general, forward checking is going to propagate information from, unass from assigned to unassigned variables, but does not provide early detection for all uh, failures. In particular, it doesn't detect looming conflicts between unassigned and other unassigned variables. That would require checking lots of pairs of variables all throughout the graph to see if anything's broken anywhere. We're going to do that. We're going to do that right after the break. But let's look at the reason why we want this. We want this here because if you look at this as before, NT and SA can't both be blue, but that is, uh, involves looking at those two variables at the same time and we should be able to detect that. So we're going to talk about algorithms for richer constraint propagation, which reason from constraint to cons constraint, and propagate these vanishing domains throughout the graph. When we come back from break, I will show you an algorithm for constraint propagation involving a concept called arc consistency, which is our core conceptual piece for this. Then we'll talk about ordering-based methods, um, and then we'll be done for the day. So let's take a couple minute break now, and when we get back, arc consistency.
All right. All right. The moment we've all been waiting for, our consistency. Like until today, we didn't even know about our consistency. All right. So we were talking about forward checking. Like it was checking some constraints, but then there were other constraints that it didn't check, and if only it would check them. What is this checking a constraint? What is this? So we need to formalize the notion of what it means to have checked a constraint. And the key concept that is going to show up in these algorithms is almost your intuitive notion of checking a constraint with a little twist. And um, it, it has to do with the notion of a consistency of an arc. So an arc, remember, there's a graph Right, there's a graph where uh, we have nodes for the variables, and we have edges connecting them if there's a constraint between those two variables. So an arc, if this is A, B, C, an arc from A to B is going to be almost like the edge to A to B, but it's going to be directed. And that means for every edge on the graph, there are actually two arcs you could check. A to B and B to A. So it's directional, even though the underlying constraint graph isn't. There's just a constraint on A and B. But we can check whether it's satisfied in two different directions, which I'll get into in a minute. The other thing is, conceptually, you can check an arc between two things that aren't connected by a constraint. So I could check whether or not A to C was OK, even though there isn't a constraint there. So it is almost the same as a constraint arc, but it's not quite. It's a directed arc between any two nodes. And we say that arc is consistent. Intuitively, it's consistent if there's no constraint violation along that arc. But formally, it's sort of a half of that. It's consistent if for every x in the tail of the arc, there is some y in the head which could be assigned without violating a constraint. So this means sort of if there was actually an assignment to A and B or to X and Y, we could check whether the assignment satisfied, satisfies the constraint. But in general, an arc is going to have a couple things in the tail and a couple things in the head. And the notion of consistent is for everything in the tail, there is at least one OK option in the head. So let's do some examples. Uh, we could look here and we could say, all right, Western Australia here is assigned. It's assigned to red. The Northern Territories are not assigned, but I can still look at the two of them and check if this arc is consistent. All right? So let's do it. We have to ask the question. We check everything in the tail. So we look at the Northern Territories and we say, is there anything in your domain, even though it's unassigned, is there anything in your remaining domain which would uh, have no continuation into the head? So we say, well, if I assigned you blue, would it be OK? Yeah, that'd be OK. If I assigned you green, would it be OK? Yeah, that'd be okay. What if I assigned you red to NT? Not okay. So red is something in the tail for which there is no assignment in the head, which doesn't cause a constraint violation. Okay. So this arc is not consistent. We can, however, make it consistent. What can we do? We can remove things from the tail. What can I do? Well, I can do just what forward checking did. I can wipe out the value that uh, caused a conflict. Okay, So now we can check other consistencies, but um, let's try this one. Q to WA. You'll notice these two don't actually, they're not connected by a constraint, so it should be easy to check. But I can ask the question, if I assign red to Q, is there an assignment which does not yet violate a constraint uh, for WA? Yes, red. How about green? Yes, red, blue. Yes, red. So this arc is already consistent. I do not need to do anything to it in order to make it consistent. So in general, um, 
in general, there's a question of how do you remember this, right? There's heads and there's tails. It's very easy to get the order. Here's how I remember it. Remember, CSPs, the constraints are like rules. And these algorithms are like police. They're going to go and they're going to enforce the rules. And you can imagine this arc is going to get pulled over by your algorithm, which is the CSP police. So here, they pull it over. And what do they do when they pull the arc over? Right? They pop open the trunk and they look for anything that's illegal. So they're going to fish around in the trunk and if they find anything bad, they're going to take it out. So that's, this is the algorithm. You pull over the arcs one by one. The algorithms differ in terms of which arcs you pull over first, how many you pull over, all that stuff. But all these algorithms have the same shape. You pull over an arc, you fish around in its trunk, and if there's anything in that trunk, any assignment to the tail, which is guaranteed to fail given what's left in the head, you cross it off. Okay, that's it. That's enforcing the consistency of a single arc. Now we're going to have to do a whole bunch of arcs in order to get a filtering algorithm. Okay, so remember, delete from the tail. Delete from the tail. Okay. Forward checking. Forward checking was enforcing the consistency of the arcs that point to each new assignment. So when I had that, if I assign to red here, I would say, all right, let's go to NT and delete anything that causes a conflict. Let's go to Q, New South Wales, Victoria, Southern Australia. And if all you do is upon every assignment... Look at all the arcs pointing to that assignment and enforce consistency, which means delete things from their tail if they cause a constraint violation. You would recover the forward checking algorithm. Now we can start talking about enforcing the consistency of lots of arcs, even ones that don't point to our assignment, and that's going to give us richer filtering algorithms. So we can talk about arc consistency of uh, an entire uh, CSP. So let's look at this. This is a CSP that's sort of in like a we're in the middle of the movie here, okay? W, A, and Q have been assigned, red and green, and that's shown on the map as well. NT, NSW, and SA have had their domains reduced by some previous pruning. So they haven't been assigned yet, even though some of them only have one value left. They haven't been assigned, but they're in various kind of stages of having been filtered. And so what we can do is we can look at this and say, all right, here's a partially assigned CSP. I can go visit arcs. Uh, I can be like... Uh, Go, go be the arc police. We're going to visit all the arcs and we're going to check them. So first we check this arc. We checked V to NSW. First we look at our graph and we notice that they are neighbors. All right, this is the first time we're checking the consistency of an arc that doesn't point to an assignment. So I go through and I check uh, the tail is, is, is V. So I'm going to check all the values. I'm going to get my police pen out here in white. I'm going to check the values and I'm going to say, what if I assigned V blue? Is there a choice at NSW that will avoid a constraint violation? Yes, I could assign it red. You're like, but there's one that creates a problem. That's fine. There only has to be some way that the head can be assigned in order to license things staying in the tail. So blue's fine. Check. Okay, how about green? That's fine, because if I assign green at V, then NSW could be either red or blue. What if I assign red? Well, now at NSW, I can't use red, but I can use blue. So this arc checks out we, 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 we declare it to be consistent and we, uh, we let it get, all, get on with its day. All right. Let's look at this one. SA to NSW. Right? Keep staring at the map. And SA and NSW are adjacent. So I'm going to look at SA and I'm going to say, well, what's in the tail? Blue. If I pick blue, do I have a choice at NSW that will be okay? Survey says? Yes. So I don't have to cross anything out. So far, this is pretty boring because I've checked a bunch of consistent arcs. But let's check the arc in the other direction. Okay, so it's the same constraint that NSW and SA can't be the same, but head and tail have been flipped. It's important for understanding these algorithms. And so we need to check it again. So now I look at NSW and I say, is red okay? Well, if NSW was red, V could be blue. Is blue okay? Well, if NSW was blue, we're toast. So we have to fish out of its trunk. Got to erase that. Got to erase that. Now it's consistent. It was not consistent before, but now that I've deleted blue from the domain of NSW, this arc has become consistent. Okay. There's a tricky case. Anybody see the tricky case? We were just here. We just checked V pointing to NSW. We just declared it consistent. But that was on the basis of having blue and red available in the head at NSW. And one of those is gone. So the consistency may no longer hold. And so I have to go back to V, and I have to check, are there any assignments to V which cannot be extended to assignments at NSW without violating a constraint? Blue? Okay. 
green, okay. Red, no longer okay. It used to be okay because blue was supporting red's okayness. But blue's gone, so we have to check this one again. And in order to make it consistent, I have to make a further modification. Now it's consistent again. Okay? So anytime you delete of uh, every time you delete a value from a domain, every arc pointing into it that was declared consistent is now questionable again, because that value that you just deleted may have been supporting their consistency. Okay, so I can keep doing this. The whole reason to do this is actually a completely different arc. It's the one between SA and NT, neither of which is assigned. But if you just look at them for a second, if you look at that arc in either direction, you will see that in fact you have to delete blue from the tail, which results in an empty domain, and an empty domain means a detected failure, which means backtracking. So if we went around and we just kind of checked all the different arcs, we would know as soon as we assigned WA to red and Q um, we made green, we would be able to detect this sort of secondary violation between unassigned variables. This is a kind of constraint propagation, and if you enforce the arc consistency of all arcs at once... Um, that's called making the graph arc consistent. That is a powerful kind of filtering. Okay, what do we need to know? If X loses a value, its neighbors need to be rechecked, which might mean their neighbors need to be rechecked, which might mean their neighbors need to be rechecked. You could worry, is this whole thing going to even converge? Okay. Arc consistency is going to detect failure earlier than forward checking, because this was the case where we were like, forward checking, just think a little harder. Uh, arc consistency will expose this if you if you make the graph arc consistent. You can run this either as a preprocessor, or more commonly, you run this after every assignment. You're still in a backtracking search, but after every assignment, you go around, you think really hard, you do a bunch of consistency checks, and you filter a bunch of stuff so that you don't have to backtrack quite so much. So this is great. What's the downside of enforcing our consistency on a graph after every assignment in a backtracking search? Your hand was up really quick. Yeah, yeah runtime could be bad. I didn't even tell you if this thing converges. Spoiler alert. It converges. Um, but it's a lot of compute. So you won't have to do as many assignments in general. But for each assignment, you're going to have to do all of this work and bookkeeping in order to enforce our consistency. This should remind you of something from search. Does this remind anybody of anything you learned last week? Like, really loosely. Okay. This is like, yeah. Uniform cost search. Okay, it reminds me of A star, because in A star you do a lot of work on each node to figure out which nodes to not explore, right? This is doing a lot of work on each assignment so you don't have to do as many assignments. Is it, are you going to come out ahead? Maybe. And so there's a trade-off between doing more filtering um, and just making the core search uh, run faster. In general, this is a very powerful method and it usually pays for itself, but it varies problem by problem. Also, remember to delete from the tail. I'll try to like tell you this every four slides or something. Here's the algorithm. This is an algorithm called AC3. Arc consistency is a property. A graph is either arc consistent or not. It's arc consistent if all arcs in the graph are consistent. You can have graphs in which some arcs are consistent and some are not. Arc consistency means all arcs are consistent. The algorithm that gets you there is called AC3. Or rather, this particular algorithm is called AC3, and it gets you there. How does it work? Um, here's the highlights. So first of all, uh, so far, we're only talking about binary CSPs, because otherwise you're talking about arcs and how they interact with three-way constraints, and we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so they're only for binary CSPs, or this algorithm is. And what do you do? You're going to have a queue, right? So inside this search, which has a queue, you're going to have a filtering algorithm, which has a queue. It's like inception, okay? So... What we're going to do with our queue is the following. We're going to pop an arc off the queue. The queue is our to-do list of, of, of arcs to check for consistency, to pull over and pull things out of the trunk. So we're going to remove something from the queue, and we're going to take out all the inconsistent values. And if you found an inconsistent value in the process of making this arc consistent, you're going to throw a whole bunch of its neighbors back on the queue because you just invalidated their consistency. That's it. That's the flow. You take things off the queue, and whenever you actually change something, you throw some neighbors back on the queue. What do you do when you pull over an arc? You go through every value in the tail domain. I should write that. I should write a T. Every value in the tail domain. Every value in the head domain. Did I get those in the right order? Well, um, 
you go through every value in the he- tail domain, and then you go through every value in the head domain, and you check, hey, constraint, are these two okay? And then if there's values in the tail for which no values in the head are okay, you delete them. So what's the runtime here? We got a two for loops, right? We got to check all the domains in the tail, and then we got to do uh, a loop over everything in the head. So the stuff down here is going to be d squared, right? Got to check every cr- everything in the cross product at worst. How much work are you going to do up here? Well, how many arcs are you going to have to look at? Well, if you didn't re enqueue things and there's n nodes, how many arcs? n squared. You look at all of them in both directions. But here's the problem. Whenever you process an arc, you might delete something from the tail. And if you do, you might have to throw a whole bunch of arcs back on. So maybe this won't even converge. But it will. Can anybody see why this might converge? Exactly. Say that again. Um, It can only go back as many times as there are things in the domain. Because you only get sent back into the queue if something was deleted from the domain you point towards. And that can only happen d times. So worst case here, you get a factor of d. This looks like it's going to be d cubed n squared. You can do some tricks to get a factor of d out of that. Um, But, you know, um, we're not, this is is going to be polynomial. It's not that bad. But we know that detecting all future problem is is going to be mp hard. And why do we know that? What if I told you satisfiability was a CSP? Now maybe it seems it seems like bad news, right? So we know that uh, that CSPs in general are NP-hard. Filtering this algorithm is not going to solve them. It's just going to detect a certain class of violations. But let's watch this algorithm in motion, and then we'll. Uh, We'll finish up our filtering and talk really quickly about ordering. All right. I don't want to do this. I want to do this. Okay. So here is an, uh, the graph for n queens. Remember, each letter is the location of one of the queens, and the values are which column that queen is in, and there's a bunch of constraints. Now, I can check by clicking here. I can check. When I click here, this is going to check the arc from A to B. And it's consistent. And now I'm going to check B to A. And it's consistent. I'm going to check E to something. It's consistent. So I'm going to just let let the applet go wild. And if I do this, it'll go around. It's got a queue. You can't see the queue, but it's got a queue. It's checking everything. And you'll notice nothing's actually happening. And that's because at the beginning, the arcs are all consistent. Because there aren't any values that Im- sort of immediately cause a conflict. Right? Until we start assigning things, we're not going to really get any value out of our consistency in this problem. But now I can go to A, and I can say, all right, I'm going to put that... Okay, it looks like I have a star at 2. So I'm going to say, I'm going to assign you to 2. Notice what happened. Notice all the arcs, at least in the way that this uh, graph, uh, this applet draws them, they've turned blue for pointing into A, because A just changed. Everything that used to point to A that used to be declared consistent back on the queue. So we can go and we can start enforcing them. So when I enforce the consistency of B to A, right, that's over here, remember? Um, it's going to say, are there any places that B can't go without being able to be extended to A? And yeah, there are. Because like, one isn't okay anymore. It was before when A wasn't assigned, but it's not okay now. And two's not okay, and three's not okay. And so when I do this, a bunch of things are going to disappear from B. One, two, and three are gone. And a whole bunch of things just went on the queue because they were relying on previous values of B. And so we can let this applet execute the whole queue. And you'll notice every red flash means I deleted something. Things go back on the queue. And this will keep going. It won't go forever uh, until it quiesces. And there's nothing left going on the queue and everything is um, everything is arc consistent. You think it's going to end up with a single solution? We're going to find out. So if you look at it right now, a whole bunch of values have vanished from those domains, but I still have to do a backtracking search because I don't actually know whether 4 is going to work out at B or 5. Maybe they'll both work out. Maybe neither will work out. But let's say I assign one. What would you guys like? 4. Decisive. Okay. Let's do it. We could detect... No luck, right? We could we we would detect that by seeing a domain go empty. And 
and it's the whole thing is arc consistent. Now, it turns out, even though the other ones aren't assigned, they only have one thing in their domain, and assigning isn't going to do anything, and you can sort of see that this is going to finish now without any, any backtracking. That's not always true. Our consistency, enforcing our consistency does not prevent all backtracking. Okay. Uh, let's see what's next. So, let's talk a little bit more about this, then we're going to quickly wrap up with ordering. So after you, enfork our, after you enforce our consistency, the following can be possible. You can have one solution left. We just saw that happen. We enforced our consistency after a couple assignments, and there was one solution left. You can have multiple solutions left, and you can have no solutions left, and do not know it. So let's look at these two examples here. Let's look at this top one. We can look at it and say, is it arc consistent? Well, let's look. This arc pointing up. Assuming these are all inequality constraints, is there anything that you have to delete from the tail to be consistent with the head? Nope, they'll both work. And I can check this one and this one. These are the tricky ones, right? One's going to be blue, one's going to be green, but both values are consistent. Um, and so that top one is consistent, and you can see there's two solutions in there, right? One where the left goes green and one where the right goes green. How about down here? Are there any solutions left to the CSP, assuming those are inequality constraints? There is no way. There is no solution there. Um, but this arc is consistent because between those two, there are two solutions left. And this arc is consistent and this arc is consistent. All the arcs are consistent. So what went wrong? Our consistency let us down here. What went wrong here? What went wrong is what's the, is the problem here is between three nodes. And our consistency traffics in pairs. right? And it will not detect violations in general uh, that are between three. All right, so it also still runs backtracking search. So let's see all of that, and then we'll quickly talk about ordering. I want this one. All right, you're ready for the big graph. All right, each node has its domains. We're still going to start in the lower left because we haven't talked about ordering yet. And if I assign something to the lower left, I'm going to assign blue, and you can think in your head what's going to happen. First, we're going to do forward checking. So I assign blue, and its neighbors lose blue. Okay, great. So I'll go to one of those neighbors, and it loses red. And look look in the upper left. It's got to be green. Forward ch ch checking has discovered this. So let's keep going. Blue. Red. So we've discovered that this one has to be green, and this one has to be green. Forward checking has discovered this. Are you worried? You're worried. Guess who's not worried? Forward checking is not worried, so we continue. So we keep on assigning things. We know it's doomed to failure. This, all this computation is a waste. It's already doomed. It's doomed. You're doomed. And now it figures it out. Once it actually assigns, only through assignment do things propagate further into the graph uh, with forward checking. So we are going to backtrack and try again. And I'll play this. So it's going to backtrack. I'll speed it up. It will eventually compute its way through this. But it keeps sort of running into this because the problem happened when? It happened like, when, when did this go wrong? Sort of like instantly, right? It was in that fourth, fourth node we were already sort of doomed. But it, it'll muddle through, okay? Let's compare that to if we enforce arc consistency, where I assign blue, and again, it's neighbor stop being blue. I assign red. Notice the upper left turns green, but also this node down here, like way in the middle of the graph, has lost green because we've propagated the consequences of that, which means as soon as we assign blue here, we already know that node that we kept trying to make green, it can't be green. It's going to be red. And this node here that we had to sort of mess around with until we discovered it needed to be green, forward consistency, or, uh, our consistency knows and doesn't have to backtrack here. But will it get through without backtracking? No. But the backtracking is not quite as bad, and it's pretty local. OK? So that's a lot better. I'm going to quickly talk about one more concept um, that should be pretty easy now that we have our consistency, and then we'll be done for the day. OK. And that is the concept of ordering. So you are journeying down your CSP. You're making decisions, like which variable do I do next? And within a variable, which values am I going to try next? And there's good decisions and bad decisions. And so far, we've just been filtering. We have not been trying to do a good job at picking variables and picking values. 
one very powerful idea is that you should pick the variable that has the fewest remaining values. How are you going to know how many values there are? Well, if you're running filtering, you can see, right? So it's minimum remaining values with respect to a filtering algorithm. So right now, everything looks the same. I'm going to assign red. But now look, I have a choice here. I could either work on this part of the graph that's sort of next to what I've already done, or I could just like teleport over here and go into the east or Tasmania or whatever. What should I do? Well, intuitively, I should keep working around where I'm placing constraints by my assignments, or r rather where, where, where constraints are kicking in. And so I should move here to uh, the Northern Territories. And one way to formalize that is to notice that at this point here, the only things left are blue and green, whereas over in Tasmania, I still have red available. So in general, if you see a domain starting to shrink, you know there's action at that variable and you might want to do your compute there. Okay. Why should it be min rather than max? Why don't I go for the variables that are most unconstrained, most free? Okay. Well, the idea here is, unfortunately, you are going to have to assign every single variable. And so if there is a problem in your assignment, given that you're going to have to backtrack, you might as well backtrack now. It's called fail fast. If you think a problem is brewing and a sign a problem is brewing is that domains are starting to shrink rapidly, you should go focus your compute there. Um, and so you should always rush into the scary door because you're going to have to assign every variable. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, and then we'll talk about one last thing. Promise. Okay. All right, let's... Forward checking. We need to do some filtering, but let's do minimum remaining value. I'm going to assign. So this is not our consistency. This is still just, still just forward checking. But I make an assignment to blue. And I make an assignment to red. And remember before there was this problem of kind of the consequences of that green in the upper left corner? And there was propagation from our consistency? Well, we could just go work on the upper left corner, right? We're running the show here. We can go to the upper left corner and assign that to green. And if we do that, now where are we going to work? This is the variable that's... that. Uh, well, it could be either of those, really. Watch, it's going to do the thing I don't expect. Nope, it goes there. And so you can see we're sort of... Our, running down the consequence of our computation so that we can find the tricky parts of the problem and sort of disentangle them right now where the backtracking will be local and relevant as opposed to teleporting all over the place. Okay, so minimum remaining values. It's called most constrained variable, um, also called fail fast ordering. You're going to have to do every variable. You might as well do the hard ones now, right? There's another way to do ordering, which is the ordering on values. So this is, okay, let's, let's, let's run headfirst to the tricky parts of the CSP and work on them so that we backtrack as quickly as possible and get all that backtracking done in a local part of the search rather than having to backtrack through a whole bunch of combinatorial stuff. What about values? So let's say we're in this scenario here where we've assigned red and we've assigned green and we're trying to decide should we assign red or blue over here to Queensland? Now, before we made our lives as hard as possible, go to the hardest part of the map, work there. Here the idea is you want to pick the least constraining value. That is the value that rules out the fewest other values. How the heck am I supposed to know what's ruled out? You're going to have to run some more filtering. This is an expensive thing to compute. But it's interesting. We went, when we picked a variable, we wanted the hardest variable. But when we pick a value, we want the easiest va value. We want, we want the one that has the least impact on the rest of the graph. So why is that? Why is it when we pick a variable, we want to do the thing that is hardest, but when we pick a value, we want to do the thing that looks least likely to fail? It's because this is a CSP. And in a CSP, you have to, you have to do every variable. Sooner or later, you have to do it. You might as well do it now. You don't have to do every value. If you play your cards right, you might not have to do very many values at all. And so you might as well do the hard uh, variables first. But if you're picking values, you want to pick the ones that are likely to work out. And maybe you don't even have to try the hard ones. OK? So when it comes to values, you take the easy door. OK, I'm going to show you one more thing. OK? All this together, ordering uh, these ideas, can let you do very large uh, problems that might have been intractable without these heuristics. Let's take a look. Backtracking AC discard. All right. Last thing for the day. We're going to do arc consistency and minimum remaining value and see what happens. 
So we'll start in the corner like we always do. Blue. So we're going to filter, we're going to propagate the consequences of our constraint, but we're going to jump to a variable that has a, a, a minimal domain. So maybe we'll do this one. Now we're going to go up uh, to the green one in the upper left. And then we're going to follow this through. And we are both propagating and jumping around the graph to the areas that seem to be hotspots. And so in this case, uh, that solved quite quickly. We would need a bigger graph to show why you would need the least constraining value uh, here. We're, we're hitting the limits. Our algorithms are getting good enough that this toy problem isn't hard, but big problems are still hard. CSPs can be very hard to solve. Next time, we'll talk about when problems are big, what kinds of techniques will work. We'll talk about um, other methods other than backtracking search, and we'll talk about exploiting the structure of your CSP. That's it. See you all on Thursday. I'm going to be using that one. Got it.